don't know me. Um, this is a series of artwork that I've been working on more recently on this wall. The other walls have some older artwork. One of the things that I did, I had a show recently and I had to fill a large space. And it's not a bad thing, but I do sell work. And when I sell it, it goes away. <laughs> so I start off with this idea and a body of work and I think, oh, the next show I have, I'm gonna have this body of work and then I don't. So when I was kind of like, oh no, how am I gonna fill this very large space? I started looking at all my artwork and trying to figure out how to tie it in together. Um, because they're all different bodies from different times in my life. And um, what I did was realize that there's transition in everything I do. And I looked into what liminality was, and that's why I have this title, Liminal State. <laughs> um, because uh, liminality is sort of like this place in between. It's the transition time. It's you're not here, you're not there, you're not from point A to point C. It's all that in between time and space. And uh, everything, whether it's a mental state or a physical construction that I've done is in a changing state. Whether it's decaying, whether it's rough waters like I have over there, whether it's being um, formed back with nature taking over, or whether it's like something more emotional or in my head or more about spirituality. It's all a journey. It's all a transitional process. Um, and then I realized that even the mediums that I work with, and I especially work with Russ, so I'll tell you all about that shortly, does that too. Um, it's a little bit of um, divination when I work uh, because it sort of takes me I start somewhere thinking that I have an end result in my head, but it takes me somewhere else. So I'm always sort of on this journey and through my process. Um, I, I end up working out my own emotions too with it. And then it's all, um, it's never finished. It's just always continuing. Uh, so I realized that this is going through all of my bodies of work, whether it's a place, a space, whether it's um, dealing with spirituality. So I do have um, a representation of you know, like three different bodies of work here, but they all connect based on this idea of liminal states, liminal space. It's always that process, that transition. It's never really complete. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll talk about this body of work first. So in 2020, my mom died of COVID. So it was tragic, it was horrible, it was all these traumatizing things. Um, but it was the main kind of emphasis for my uh, deep dive into consciousness and spirituality because when something happens to you um, that's really that deep, um, you can take a bad way or you can take a good way. Um, so I was like, well, how can I turn this into a positive? So I started looking into like what I believe and what my thoughts are. And it's not like this wasn't always there, but I really didn't fully develop things. So um, it, it made me pause, it made me take time to look at everything that's around me that I don't normally look at. We're in a world where we have these destinations. I'm going to graduate from college. I'm going to go get this wonderful job. I'm going to go you know, to a nursing home. <laughs> like I have these states in my life. I have my sweet 16, I have, um, you know, my bar mitzvah, and there's always some sort of stopping point from A to, to C, you know, and, and I just like, all this time we're trying to do these things, we never really stop and look at what's in between, which is that liminal, you know, pause, like where the heck am I going? What am I doing? What can I look for? What can I find? What can I see? So I'm physically actually slowing myself down and looking and stopping, looking at things that I didn't see before, but I'm also on that journey, that in between, not knowing where I'm going. Um, so uh, this body of work came after my mom's death, but it, uh, it represents my dive into that area of consciousness and thinking about how we're energy and what happens after we die. 
I believe in the afterlife, and of course I've been studying all of that. Um, and um, one of the things that is good for me because we're material people is that we've got this uh, grow light for plants. And it kind of started me into all of this uh, because uh, the grow light constantly, not constantly, but glues on every now and then, but since her death, we didn't have this before she died. We started growing plants um, and it just pops on. So we've timed it, we've looked at it, I've scheduled it and like, we have no, he's an electrician. We have no reason <laughs> to know why this light is doing this. And so there's a lot of things that are like signs that are coming into my life and just making me feel like there is something beyond and something more. Uh, so this work is based on that. I mean, what you'll see is a lot of symbols, a lot of um, things peeking through, like over here where you have like the eye peeking through like somebody's watching. Um, I always feel like there's some sort of sign out there um, randomly. So it's just about personal information, but I came home one night and uh, there was a red like winter robin and it was just staring at me and it was like 11 o'clock at night. I had no idea why it was there. I was like, is this freezing? Is there something wrong with it? I dragged my boyfriend out, <laughs> like, can you come? You know, what do I do? Should I save this robin? I don't know. And then the robin left. And then there was no sign of like a dead or frozen robin. You know, and it's like weird things like that that you start to think about, hmm, is there something else going on? You know, or numbers that keep reappearing in your life or deja vu or all that kind of stuff. So a lot of these works are about the signs that sort of peek through. Um, same with this. And if you notice that they're all in a state of decay. Things are uh, popping out, but things are also crumbling. So what's happening here is what happens when you're in a liminal state. Uh, there's a transition, something happens, and let's just say it's something that is jarring. Um, <clears throat> it starts to crumble, and new stuff reemerges. So these signs that are coming through is sort of like my consciousness changing, and I guess you could say like awakening, um, but things are coming through. So even though liminal states are usually based off of like something maybe jarring that happens, there's always something good. There's always something on the precipice, something that's gonna change. It's about change. And we are constantly changing. We are constantly, um, you know, going through something, coming from one area to another and then something else is on the horizon. And so when the things come through, you know, it's showing that there's something more that's attainable, something is going to, uh, you know, clear skies in some way. So uh, I think uh, a lot of my work is about that change and about that um, change to the positive now. But when you look at my older work that's around the corner, like the building and um, the rough waters over there, that kind of stuff. I'm still, still on this journey, I'm still ser uh, searching, but a lot of it's kind of decaying and there's a little less of this idea of renewal. So I feel like it's kind of transitioned to more of that renewal aspect, but one of the things I love to do when I was in abandoned buildings and houses and stuff is to actually see nature coming through and when you do see nature coming through these buildings, and I do have other work with nature coming through, it is like that renewal. Because what's happening is that this physical monument's falling, but nature's taking over. So you've got that birth and that, I mean, that death, but then you have a birth from it. So that's what it is. We're in this constant shift of, you know, life, growth, death, life, growth, death, and whether it's something abstract, like in your consciousness, or whether it's a physical plant, a physical building, a physical body, it's just the constant change. And so it's about those times when we're not quite sure where we're going and that journey we're taking. So how does my media fit into it? Um, my media, a lot of this is, um, has a base that's rust. And so 
<clears throat> when I do rust printing, it's really a contact print. Um, so a contact print is um, you're not going through a press, you're not um, doing anything but putting a plate on top of your substrate, which is for me paper. In this case, <laughs> not always. <laughs> so the plate contacts the paper and it makes an impression on it. So if anybody's done like cyanotype or um, any process where you put like a photograph on top of a piece of paper and let the sun come through, it's called a contact print. So it's a contact and print printing process, but you don't really know what's going to happen, just like in life and in the transitions. There are certain things you can know about it. There's a little bit you can control. You can control the tones. So when I have a metal plate that's rusted, usually it's like a rusted steel. Um, I use different vinegars, wine, tea, anything with tannins in it. Um, and anything that's acidic. Certain acids work better than others. Um, it bleeds onto the paper. So you can control the tones based on what type of acid or tannin you use and the paper, the pH in the paper, different kind of papers will change a tone. As, and you can control where you put rusty objects or rusty plates onto your paper, but then it bleeds. And you put a sheet of plastic on top of your piece of rust and paper where it's contacted and you let it perspire. So that bleeding into each other, it starts to make all sorts of patterns. And you look at your patterns when you're done and it's like, how am I gonna work with this now? I thought I was gonna use this image or I thought I was gonna go this way. And it just sort of takes you on that journey and down that rabbit hole of what do I do next? And then you add something to it and it's like, okay, now I have to add something else. So even if there's like a sort of destination in my head, a point C, I'm always taken off, you know, and going down that uh, <laughs> liminal <laughs> highway of it. So um, the base of most of these prints are rust. And if they're not, it's not the base, it's been used in a lot of the collage material that I do. And then I go with it with other printmaking techniques. Uh, like in this one, I have silk screen. In the paintings, I have silk screen. Um, I have etching where you'll see some of these lines. Um, the cross lines are a base of etching. And I also want to point out the connections between everything. Um, I think we're all connected. I think we all may be different, but we're all the same too. And I think we're connected to animals, to space, to to greenery, to the trees, you know. Um, if you look at it, like um, even from the palm of your hand to uh, the veins in your body, to the rings of a tree, to the grain of a tree, um, to the pattern in a leaf, it's very much similar. And I do think there's connection. So I use these lines to show that connection. And those are usually done with uh, etching plates that I have. Uh, and I also do a little bit of lino cut, a little bit of wood cut. And so you'll see little aspects of lino cut like in here and wood cut here. And you will also see um, some litho, but it is ponto plate litho, which is something that you can uh, print a photograph on, black and white, and you can roll it like you're gonna roll ink onto an actual litho stone. But these are real easy plates. It's close to paper lithography. And they can be used multiple times, but not as long as you would use a stone in lithography. So it's sort of like the cheaper, uh, easier version of lithography. But I put that in here. Um, and let me point out a few more things. Uh, I use also a lot of bowls gold sort of to represent um, heavenly or like otherworldly, that kind of thing, sort of like always been done in art history. Um, that's even the Byzantine era. So I do use gold to represent that. Or some metallics and it's gold leaf. Um, so I apply that and let me just see if there's any other monotypes. So I go back in with monotypes, which is painting on um, plexiglass and run it through a press. So half of them are, parts of them are done through a press, parts are done through contact printing, 
Uh, so there's just a little bit of everything. And I also go in sometimes with painting tools. Sometimes if there's a spot that I need to pull out in some way. Around the corner, you're gonna see some images that look photographic. That's used with, um, so there's another process, you don't always know what's gonna happen, but gel transfer. So if you take a photocopy or a laser print and you put gel down and you let it sit on it, let it dry, I'm gonna smooth it out with sure it's tight, um, you then wipe off the paper, all the fibers of the paper with water. And what happens is it starts to peel up and you start to see your photo. And sometimes it's perfect. And sometimes if a little part was wet or there was a little wrinkle or something just didn't go quite right or adhere quite right, it starts to pull up and it looks like it's deteriorated. So you don't always know what you're gonna get. And that takes you down that <laughs> alley too. So a lot of the stuff is like just um, taking me down the process to the complete image. And then sometimes I look at them and I don't even think they're done. So when they get done a show, I'll take them out and I might add something else to them. <laughs> so I don't have that like fear of destroying things because I'm working with that change in that process and I'm open to it. And so I hope that comes through in like my new uh, artwork, but that's, that's how I work. So it's all about change, transition, the journey, the process. And that's why I call it the mental state. <laughs> So, um, does anybody have any questions? When you work with rust, you do like a plate that's rusty. Mm -hmm. And then do you put the paper on top of that, or is that? So, you can either put it on top or underneath. But, um, I have, uh, so this is a cool thing to do, and it is a really easy thing to do. I have some large plates of, um, just sheets of actual rusted steel, or steel that I intend to rust as well. Um, but you can also just like walk down the street, pick up any rusty item and start collecting them. So you can use a large plate, uh, you can use a, like sheet metal, or you can use things that you find on the train track or at the side of a car or in a garage. Um, and you can also find things on eBay sometimes. So I found a bunch of steel cuttings that were kind of leftovers from somebody who does, um, you know, just cutting steel for actual selling. Like here's a sign for my wall made of steel kind of thing. And you'll see like over here, I have a skeleton in here, the skull face. That's from one of those cutouts. So they're like discarded cutouts. So there's all sorts of things that you can use. You just have to get the right kind of metal that will actually rust. So if you're doing a large plate, it's easy to put the paper on top. But otherwise what you want to do is actually put your paper down. You could put damp, it's better to have damp paper. Um, then you would put your items where you want them and arrange them in a composition. So there's a little bit of control, but that changes later on because you don't know really what you're gonna get. Um, you would put the vinegars before you actually put the items on the paper. So if I have um, a landscape in mind, I might decide that I'm gonna put a red line down as one layer, like a horizon line. And then I might put uh, apple cider vinegar on top. They're gonna to make different tones. So the apple cider vinegar is gonna be a little more orange and the red line could be a little grayer or blacker. So there are certain things that you can do to kind of know what's happening, but then it all meets. So if there's paper, wet paper better. Vinegars or wines or anything acidic. You gotta kind of experiment with different things. Rust, rusty bits, and then saran wrap or any kind of plastic. Let it perspire and you let it sit. And then you can do it again if you want to. You can keep working on it. The thing is, the question that I get a lot about with the rust prints is is it archival? Because when you're working for, you know, to, for somebody to buy your piece for a lot of money, although mine don't cost a lot, which is why I sell them, um, <laughs> you want them to be archival. So you can do things like spray them. You can spray them with um, an acrylic sealer of some sort. Uh, there's all sorts of things. But the other thing is, 
you can just let life happen, just like the liminal state. <laughs> so I've got lots of layers on top of mine, a lot of things happening. That's going to hold in the rest as you know, long as possible. But if something happens, I just let it happen to it, you know? And by the time anybody bought my million dollar painting, I'd be dead. So I don't worry about that, <laughs> what happens in the museum. That's for a conservationist. Um, so, so yeah, so that's basic cross printing. It's a really easy process. You want to make sure that your items are tight. So if they're not heavy objects, you want to sit like books on top of them or something to weight them down. But a really simple process. It just takes a lot of experimenting. Um, it is actually a uh, fiber process. So people will dye scarves and different things with rust. And that's where it comes from. When you apply it to paper, you do have to think about what kind of paper you're going to use. It's good to use heavyweight printmaking paper because it's not going to rip and tear. But you also get a lot of good patterns with like paper, um, Asian rice papers that you would get for wood cutting. Um, that kind of paper works really well. It's kind of pliable and it doesn't usually rip unless it's cheap paper that it rips. <laughs> Um, 
and then the inking takes seconds. <laughs> what makes the actual putting it on the piece of paper. So it really doesn't take a lot of time. But yeah, it's really the thought that, and, and where the process takes you that takes the time. If you kind of go astray, then it'll take you a little bit longer to figure it out. There's a lot of resiliency in these pieces, and that's how I relate to everything you were saying. Um, again, thank you for thank sharing. you. <laughs> <laughs> I do, and I'm learning about it and going down rabbit holes that my friends here think I'm a little crazy <laughs> for. <laughs> they think I might need a, an intervention. <laughs> oh, yeah, we might hear about this. I actually, um, I did go into listening to people talk about extra dimensions and channeling extra dimensions. And this is where they really think I need the intervention. Yeah, yeah. Was the spiders and the berries. Well, there were spiders and fairy rats involved yeah. with the channeling, so yeah. <laughs> it's stuck in their head. But I do believe, I believe anything's possible. I believe that we are all energy and that, you know, I'm trying to prove that we actually, to myself, that we actually do see our families again, because that's the main part of like my intention here and why I do that. But I believe that, you know, we do exist after this life and I believe that we may come back. Um, I do believe in that feeling of like you've been someplace before or you've, you know, and I've had that feeling. Um, so it, yeah, I believe in reincarnation, but I'm open to believing a lot of things and to the dismay of my friends sometimes, <laughs> maybe a little too much. <laughs> so yeah, but I do believe that we're just energy and we do go somewhere after this and then we can come back and that there are other places to go. I believe that we can be on other planets um, <laughs> and that people who are channeling information, some of them are legit. Um, at least if they're not legit, they believe they are. So it's their truth, you know? So if if somebody really believes what they're saying, then, you know, it's the truth and you believe it because they're putting that out there. If somebody's saying something and, you know, it sounds like they're lying and you know that they don't truly believe it, you kind of know that. So when I watch these people or read these books, you know, I, I believe that these people believe these things. They believe that everything they say happens to them, happens to them. So I read a lot of books about reincarnation about the afterlife, about all of that stuff. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say I spend a lot of time down here, and <laughs> every time I walk past your pieces, I see something new within the layers, and I love that. And it just goes along with your whole theme. Also, mm -hmm. like we have layers as people, and you really did a great job at representing that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a little crazy. 
Uh, it's not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I'm apt to sometimes believe what people might put out there, or at least come up with my own ideas about it. But I do think that there's an element of control in our media. Um, so, you know, I think you have to think for yourselves and make your own choices and decide. Because even if it's something you want to hear, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. There is always an agenda. So, uh, yeah, so I do, I have thought about that a lot, especially with um, the presidency and everything that happened. But, and sometimes it's a little awkward to put it up on the wall now. So, yeah, yeah. But I do feel like it probably is still a little lies. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to what's out there. Just make up your own opinion. that want to sell 
a ten thousand dollar you know piece of artwork to the dentist's office, and they're okay with that. But you, it really does show in your work, and um, I think that's so profound. Well, I think one of the things too, and I read lots, and I hate to say these things, but as you go and you experience life and whatever where it takes you, you start to realize that. You're not this person that I'm going to be a doctor when I'm this age. I'm going to have a family when I'm this age. That life is just going to take you. And you can either embrace it and go with it, or you can fight it and try to be this person that you created. And I'm at a point where I'm just going with it and stop worrying about what I was going to be when I grew up. And you know, where you know, where it's gonna take me, I'm letting the journey kind of just take me and just see what happens because um life is too short to you know just be like I have to get there. We miss so much trying to get to whatever point it is we're trying to get to that I just don't think it's worth it, you know. So just just try to find yourselves, you know, and live as happy as you can live. <laughs> For me, art is part of my life every day. Like, I, I do teach it, um, but I have a friend who always says when I have an Amazon list stuff, because I do like to give people what I want. I put my <laughs> Amazon list stuff, make it easy for everybody. But it's usually either all art or spiritual stuff. And she's like, no, I want to get you something fun, so I'm not going to get it from your list. But I'm like, this is my life. This is fun for me. Some people have a job. But my job is part of my life. It's my hobbies. It's my every day. It just is. So I kind of got to the point where I live art. You know, whether I make money at it or not, it's not it's not the thing for me. So everybody has their own path. But yeah, that's one of those things that I realized. Like this is part of my every day. <laughs> so so you'll find yourselves, and when you do, you'll know it. And just keep going. Just let the world take you. In the end, we may all come back anyway. So. <laughs> Nicole, your mom must be clapping that you're doing an academic paper. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think she I, must be very excited. I, think I channeled her after she died. I started reading a lot. I was one of those people. My mom was an English teacher here, and I was one of those people that. I, I like pictures and books. Um, I don't read instructions. I give them to him. Um, <laughs> that kind of thing. But I just started reading and reading and reading. And now I like read all the time, like every night. Um, so I kind of went down that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but it just, it happens. Of course, I'm reading things that scare my friends sometimes. <laughs> her, mom, her mom just wasn't a teacher. Her mom was one of our most prolific academics. <laughs> so, yeah. Meredith was one of her students. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and had a focus on death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did find that, like, I was going through a lot with my mom because she was sick for a while. And so, like, when COVID took her, she wasn't a wealthy person. Um, and I looked more and more at death. But I actually started early on looking at things <laughs> and learning about death because. She was into, she's the one who taught me about postmortem photography, and she was into the Victorian, all the dark side of it, and we go to cemeteries and take pictures of little icons on the cemetery fields and things like that. So she kind of started me on that alley. But then I think I was trying to like figure out, well, if, if this happens, how am I going to deal with it? And how am I going to deal with death? And I think we're scared of death. And, and the way they, they teach us and everything, and, and I want to not be afraid of that. So I went down the rabbit hole of that <laughs> and tried to learn about that. So yes, she, she did. She was quite morbid. You know, but she was very cheery, just like you are. Cheery, <laughs> <She's> morbid. Morbid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She definitely had that side to her <laughs> and joked a lot at funerals. And <laughs> No, but I would love 
love to be able to have dreams that I could remember and have tried to learn how to do that. So actually I am in the process of learning how to meditate more because this is not something that I do regularly. Um, but if you're dreaming and having visions, that's a great way to make art and you should record it. Anytime you do, have it by your bedside, put it in your book, write down, or even draw a picture and do that because you can come up with great art. I don't, I wish I was like really psychically inclined <laughs> and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm a wannabe. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm trying to learn how to slow that down because I was like monkey brain all the time before this happened. It was like one thing to the next. And I can't, I can remember my dreams sometimes. But like one of my dreams that I kept reoccurring was me working in a store and having my jewelry there, which is why I'm taking jewelry classes now. But that's not going to go for painting. So, or like my uh, high school teacher, um, my dance teacher torturing us somehow or us running away from her. There was a whole thing there. Those are the kind of dreams I have. So they're not really visions, um, not things I would want to put. But if you have them, you should definitely write them and do them. I think it comes out of us in different ways. Nicole, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.